home blackberry and okay raspberry. are we good we're good okay great we're going to talk about blackberry and raspberry production from a standpoint of home production and uh let me move this over uh with any fruit crop uh the higher up you can get those fruit the better for frost protection. You can see down in the lower right hand side, this is my backyard. You can see there's a frost pocket from down, down from there and you can see the frost down there. And right here in the right hand side where I've got some uh, erect thornless blackberries, we don't have the frost. So uh, it doesn't take much of an elevation to get a fairly large uh, difference in temperature. Uh, you don't want it on too steep a slope. Uh, uh, you want to be uh, fairly tractor friendly or be able to at least get on that uh, uh, land when it's uh, the grass is wet. Uh, for blackberries and raspberries and eastern, eastern north facing slope works out pretty well because they don't get as hot and you get the uh, sunlight coming up in the east and it dries the plants off earlier in the morning. It reduces some of your disease problems. Uh, good internal soil drainage is very important. Uh, you need to have oxygen in that soil and that soil can't be full of, of water all the time, uh, particularly true in the, in the summer when they're growing. And uh, uh, you know, if you've got a high water table, you're gonna have Phytophthora root rot problems that kill your blackberries. So alternatively, you can put them on a raised bed a little bit of a raised bed and that'll protect you from Phytophthora if you've got a little wetter site. Uh, soil depth is important. If you've got three feet of soil under there, you'll have water holding capacity to get you through some pretty dry uh, periods. Uh, you wanna do a soil test before you plant. Test for phosphorus, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, and the soil pH. The picture here shows a field that I wouldn't wanna plant. It's full of broom sedge. That means there's something really wrong with that property. The, phosphorus or the potassium are really low or the, the pH is, is really low in that, in that site. Uh, broom sedge grows on really poor land and does well on poor land. So you're looking for uh, a pH of 6.4 to 6.6 .6 ideally. That's the acidity level of the soil. Uh, phosphorus level of greater, greater than 70 pounds per acre, greater than 300 pounds per acre of potassium, and greater than 120 pounds per acre of magnesium. Now you can get too much potassium or phosphorus or magnesium in the soil. So uh, if you do that, you'll have nutrient problems too. Uh, uh, you wanna have the capability of doing some irrigation. Uh, blackberries and raspberries uh, really shrivel up if it's dry uh, when you're harvesting those. You wanna get your uh, perennial weeds under control before you the year before you plant things like uh, uh, Johnson grass and yellow nut sedge and things that can give you problems with your planting and you want to make sure you haven't had other brambles blackberries or raspberries uh, or solanaceous crops we're talking tomatoes potatoes eggplants uh, tobacco in that land for two years previous to this or strawberries those will build verticillin and wilt up in the soil and it'll jump on your blackberries and raspberries. Birds are a big problem with blackberries and raspberries, particularly black raspberries. And of course, if you've got wild turkeys around, it's hard to fill up one of those wild turkeys. Uh, here's the impact of uh, pH on the soil fertility. And you can see this uh, yellow bar here. Uh, the, the dark areas here show the availability of the different nutrients and you can see if you get too low or you get too high, those nutrients can be in the soil, but they're bound up and the plant just chemically can't get them out of there. So adjusting that soil pH before you plant is really important. You can't do it very easily after you put them in the ground. It's almost impossible. And you wanna till that into the, till those fertilizers into the soil. Here's a raised bed as a possibility. If you've got a, a site that's a little bit uh, on the wet side, this will uh, allow your raspberries and blackberries to survive. Uh, before you plant, you want to broadcast any of your lime and fertilizer at least over the rooting area of your bed. And uh, if you can grow a cultivated crop, uh, other than the crops we talked about the previous year, that will help build up uh, some organic matter in the soil. If you put a cover crop on or something like that, that helps out a whole lot. 
Uh, you want to get the fertilizer tilled in as deep as you can. If you can get it tilled in with a rototiller down to six to nine inches uh, in the fall or early spring is ideal. Uh, if you've got a steeper slope, you know, if you're putting a bigger planting in, we'll broadcast it over the whole area and till it in. But uh, if you're on a steeper slope, we'll broadcast it in a four to six foot wide uh, strip and till that in. You want to make sure you're spacing your rows to fit your equipment. Uh, some of these blackberries can get pretty big. If you're using a, oh, oh, a riding lawnmower or a larger one, you want to space them out a little bit further. If you've got a push mower, you can put them in a little bit closer. But then again, if you put them too close, they don't dry out as fast and you have more disease problems. Uh, so you want to till it well before planting. Uh, the question is, how do you tell a blackberry from a raspberry? And with blackberries, the receptacle or the center part of this berry stays with the fruit. Uh, on raspberries, the receptacle remains on the plant and that raspberry is hollow inside. So that's an easy way to tell raspberries from blackberries. A little bit of terminology on blackberries and raspberries. Uh, we have uh, the canes are what we call biennial. A cane lasts two, se two seasons. After the second season, that cane dies and you've got a new one coming up to replace it. So the cane that comes up the first season is called a primocane. And right here you can see in the spring the new primocane starting to come out. Uh, they will grow up and typically most primocanes don't fruit. And then that cane winters over. And uh, here's an example of a primocane. This one was headed and it's got lots of branches on. This is a primocane that you want to prune out in the, uh, the next spring because the big fat canes or the heavy canes are the ones that produce the big fruit. These don't produce the very big fruit. So uh, typically you uh, top these to get them to send lateral branches out and you get your fruit off of these lateral branches. Okay, after it winter's over, it becomes what are, is called a floricane. And here's the early spring. You can see all the floricanes on these blackberries. Uh, this is kind of before pruning. Uh, here's a dead floricane after it's fruited and you can see all the laterals and you can see all the, the flower clusters and that had berries on, on this. Notice right here on the tip of that uh, floricane, this is where it was headed as a primocane the previous season and that caused it to send out branches. Yeah, we have a number of different types of blackberries. Uh, I think you're all uh, uncomfortably familiar with thorny blackberries. Uh, you don't need a trellis for these. They're the hardiest ones. They'll They'll survive down to about minus 17 degrees Fahrenheit. These are the first fruit to be harvested in the spring. The fruit are sweet. The seeds are relatively small. That's the real advantage of these thorny ones. If you've got problems with seeds, uh, the seeds are really small on these. But most growers and pickers and homeowners just don't want to grow those thorny ones. They're too nasty to deal with in the yard. We've got some really good alternatives. We have erect thornless blackberries. These are a relatively new type of blackberry. Uh, we have a minimal trellis. These get killed, uh, the, the, the floor canes get killed when you hit about minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So we lose the crop. Down in your area of the state, it very rarely gets down to minus 10. Uh, these are second in the sequence to be harvested. So the thorny ones come in first. They're followed by the thornless erect ones. Uh, most people think that Thornless berries are really tart and the thorny ones are the sweetest one. That is not true anymore. These erect thornless ones are as good or better than thorny ones in blind taste tests. So uh, there's been a big change in that in the last 10 or 15 years. The seeds are a little larger on these than the thorny erect varieties. And these are not real heavy producers, but these are the ones I generally recommend for uh, home, home uh, blackberry producers. Then we have the semi-erect thornless blackberries. These are the real heavy producers. These are the ones you associate with being, having a, a tart thornless blackberries. And that's because the uh, sugar content was leaked genetically. <laughs> and so they had trouble breeding that out. Uh, these are winter killed at about minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. They're third in the berry sequence, berry harvest sequence. Uh, these are generally pretty tart until they're really ripe. The berries and the seeds are large. These are our most productive varieties, but they are a lot more susceptible to spotted wing Drosophila that we'll talk about later on. So 
These are our recommended blackberry cultivars right now. Uh, for erect thorny ones, Chickasaw and Kiowa are two of the better ones. For the erect thornless ones, the first, these are in order of ripening. The first one to come in is Natchez. It's a very big berry. It can be a little tart sometimes if we have rainy or cloudy weather. Uh, Ponza is a brand new one. It's an outstanding tasting one. It is a short internode blackberry. In other words, it has a very short distance between the leaves and it's gonna concentrate the berries and make them harder, easier to pick rather. Uh, these aren't available yet. They've got a few on the market, but they're all sold out. So this will be something to look for next year. Uh, John Clark, the breeder of Natchez, thinks Ponza is gonna replace Natchez. Uh, Ponza doesn't have quite as big a berry as Natchez, but uh, a very balanced flavored berry, at good sugar content and a little tartness. Cato is a new variety that's just been released this year. Uh, that would be one of my top recommendations right now. It's a really good taste in berry and it's got a really good level of disease resistance. So it's gonna make it much easier for homeowners to grow this one. Uh, Wachita is a really good tasting one. This has been around a lot longer than the other ones on the list here. And uh, it's a little smaller berry and Osage is another one that's a very good taste in berry. Uh, I've got this one in my backyard and I'm seeing a little bit more disease problem on this than I'd like to see, but this is a very good tasting one. Then we get to the semi-erect thornless ones. We've got triple crown. This is the best tasting of the semi-erect thornless ones. So if you're gonna plant one of these in your backyard, uh, this, this is a really good one. It has less acidity and it has a little higher sugar content than Chester. Chester is the big producer. If you're just after blackberries, Chester is gonna outproduce any of these other ones. But this one can be pretty tart. Uh, there are trailing blackberries. You've heard of boysenberries and marionberries and there's black diamond and siskiyou and a number of other ones. These just aren't hardy in Kentucky. They freeze down to the ground. You lose your floor cane unless you lay them down on the ground and cover them up. Uh, boysenberries and marionberries are pretty soft berries. They're more for processing. They're not something you can uh, sell on the roadside or get to hold up real long. <clears throat> the newest types of blackberries that have been developed are the primocane fruiting blackberries. These are different from the other ones we've talked about. These will fruit the first year on the tips of the primocanes going into the fall and then the next year they'll fruit on the bottom portions of the canes. Uh, the first two here are very good ones, but they are thorny and they are heavily thorned, okay? Uh, very good quality on both of these. Both of them are very productive. <clears throat> uh, then we have the Primarchane fruiting thornless ones. And the two best ones here are Primark Traveler, and I've seen that in Lowe's. I bought one at Lowe's last year. And then Stark Black Gem. Uh, that's a patented one that Stark only sells. Uh, Stark Black Gem is a larger berry than Traveler. Tra Traveler is not a very big berry, but it is a firm berry. It holds up very well after you pick it. Stark Black Gem is a softer berry. You'll see other varieties out there uh, like uh, Freedom. Uh, Freedom is just not productive for us in Kentucky, and I'll show you that. Here are some of those uh, erect thornless blackberries. There's Natchez over on the right. That's a big berry, that first one to come in. And then Osage and Wachita, really nice looking berries. This is Natchez, you can see the size of this. This is a first to ripen and this has replaced Arapaho. Arapaho was the first of the thornless erect varieties to be released and it doesn't have the production of Natchez. Very large berries, no sterile droplets. What this means is, you know, some of the previous berries, uh, these, each one of these little juice sacs on the berry is a female flower or pistil on the berry and it has to get pollinated. And some of those in earlier varieties were sterile. So you had a little pucker in the fruit where that uh, juice sac didn't develop or droplet didn't develop. This has good flavor and sweetness if you've got nice sunny weather. You know, you get your best flavored blackberries when you've got cool nights, you've got lots of sunshine and uh, dry weather. Uh, we get the uh, blackberries that are a little tartar and the ones that aren't as sweet when we have a lot of cloudy, rainy weather and hot temperatures. Hot temperatures increase the respiration rate and it burns the sugars up faster than cool weather. And of course, if you've got a lot of rainy weather, the uh, sun cuts down on photosynthesis and the water 
gets pumped into the berry and dilutes the sugars out. So when it gets up to about 9.5% soluble solids or percent, roughly percent sugar, uh, yield is twice that Arapaho. So it's had uh, some really good yields. <clears throat> uh, fruit storage and handling are pretty good. Uh, the diseases of orange rust and rosette uh, are pretty limited uh, and limited fruit anthracnose. So we're looking for stuff that has orange rust resistance and rosette resistance and anthracnose resistance. And, uh, you know, resistance is not immunity. So some are a little bit more resistant than others, but we bypass a lot of them. For example, uh, well, some of the other earlier varieties like uh, uh, Navajo uh, was pretty susceptible to orange rust. It was a good berry, but I lost one in my backyard to it. Uh, this is uh, Wachita. <clears throat> uh, you can see it's a little smaller berry than the other ones. Uh, earlier than Apache. Apache is a nice berry, but it has a lot of what we call white droplets in it, so we're not recommending that one right now. It's six to seven grams. Excellent flavor. Ten plus si percent soluble solids. Uh, pretty decent yields. Good post-harvest handling. It's a firmer berry. It holds up. Plants vigorous, resistant to rosette. We haven't seen any orange rust on this one. Here's Osage. This is the first low acid blackberry. Uh, I really like the flavor of this one. It's a really good blackberry. Uh, firm fruit with a good shelf life, uh, similar in size to Wachita, a little smaller berry. Here's Triple Crown. It's the largest of the semi-erect. It's a nice big round berry, uh, about 7.6 grams. It's got a sweet aromatic flavor and pleasant aftertaste. Gets up to 11% soluble solids. It has lower yields than Chester and, and Hull is an older variety. Berries are firm, don't hold up as well as Chester and Hull, and it's resistant to rosette, orange rust, and Phytophthora. I have seen orange rust in this one when we've got a lot of it around in the wild blackberries. Here's Chester. This is the big yielder of the bunch. Uh, it's pretty tart. 9.5% uh, soluble solids, a uh, six gram berry. So it's smaller berry than triple crown. Uh, this is the one that has the highest yield. So if you're making wine out of blackberries, this is a good one to grow for wine. Uh, also very good for cobblers and so forth where you're adding a uh, sugar to it. Resistant to rosette orange rust, most resistant to cane blight. It is susceptible to Phytophthora, the root rot that we talked about in wetter soils. Okay, this is a Primark 45, the, the uh, uh, thorny primocane fruiting blackberry out of Arkansas. I'm not going to concentrate on the thorny ones, but uh, the problem with these primocane fruiting blackberries is when we have summers with temperatures of about 85 degrees or higher in August for about a week, uh, the flowers abort and you don't get much of a fall crop. That has happened the last two years. Some of these varieties are a little more resistant to this, but uh, some of the better ones just didn't have much of a crop last year for you, you'll remember how hot it, hot it was. Uh, little smaller berry size, excellent flavor, uh, really good flavor. Uh, fruit color remains black. Some of these blackberries, when you cook them, they turn a reddish color. They don't re retain their black coloration. So this one stays black. No orange rust, uh, slight anthracnose uh, found on it. And it's, uh, First harvest is about five, four days after Natchez, so uh, a fairly early one on the primocane fruit. This is Prime Jim versus, I'm sorry, Prime Jan, an over, one of the first primocane fruiting thorny blackberries released. And here's Primark 45, one of our recommended thorny ones. And you can see the kind of berries we got with a hot summer on these versus Primark 45. These are uh, Kentucky State University has been doing a lot of the primocane fruiting blackberry test for us in Kentucky. So we're using their information. This is uh, Jeremy Lowe is the, and Kirk Pomper too and Sherry Crabtree are the ones that are working on these. But you can see the Primark Traveler, the uh, thornless primocane fruiting one, 2013 had a fairly decent yield. Uh, 2014 it was hot. These are these are the primocane yields in the fall, the, not including the floricane yields. They just mow them off to, to prune them. Here's Primark 45, a little lower yield and a little bit better yield in 2014. Here's Primark Freedom. This is why we're not recommending this one in Kentucky. It just doesn't have the yield. But it does have a really big fruit size, so 
we're recommending the Starks uh, Black Diamond for this. Uh, Primark Travelers, Jeremy's favorite uh, one to eat. So, uh, but all of these taste very good. Give you a little bit, bit better idea of the size. There's Primark 45, that's a thorny one. There's Primark Traveler, uh, uh, really good uh, storage life and flavor. There's Primark Freedom, a really big one, but it just doesn't have the yields. Uh, looking at raspberry varieties, <clears throat> there's a number of different raspberry varieties and types of raspberries. Uh, we have June bearing red raspberries and Prelude, Encore, and Boyne are very good ones. Prelude is probably the top one. It comes in very early. Then we have the June bearing black raspberries. Uh, Jewel is the one we've been growing for the last 30 years. It's the most disease resistant. It's a really nice black raspberry. Mac Black comes in a little bit after Jewel. It overlaps its production. That's also a very nice one. But the black raspberries are the <clears throat> ones that have the shortest lifespan. They're the hardest ones to keep alive. <clears throat> then we have the June bearing purple ones and Royalty is the one we recommend. These are crosses between the black and the red raspberries. Then we have fall bearing red raspberries and we're not recommending these anymore because of spotted wing drosophila. Uh, Joan Jay is almost thornless, then Caroline and Heritage is a really old variety that's done well over the years. We have some fall bearing yellow ones, again not recommended because of uh, spotted wing drosophila, Anne and fall gold are two nice yellow ones. There's Prelude, uh, this one has a small fall crop on it, but its main crop is the spring and it comes in pretty early. That's a really nice uh, quality red raspberry. <clears throat> There's Jewel, a black raspberry, a nice big raspberry, excellent flavor. I like black raspberries. This is the one I like to eat. Uh, this is Royalty, uh, June bearing raspberries. These make very good jams and jellies. Uh, here's Caroline, a fall bearing one. Uh, it's been around for a number of years. It's been a good one. Uh, before spotted wing drosophila came in and the fall bearing ones bear their fruit on the tip of the primocane the first year and then they overwinter and have the rest of the crop on the lower portion of the cane uh, as a floor cane. <clears throat> and these are two of the yellow fall bearing raspberries and in fall gold. Uh, when you're ordering plants, ideally you want to order blackberry and raspberry plants the fall before you plant them to get the varieties you want. Uh, here's a nice looking uh, raspberry uh, plant right here. Uh, <clears throat> you'll want to get uh, the copy of this presentation to see the, the spacing on these, but uh, the thorny erect are put in uh, rows uh, two feet, space two feet apart in the row, thornless erect, three feet apart, thornless semi-erect, six to eight feet apart, and the primocane fruiting blackberries, two to three feet apart. So uh, the rows are 10 to 12 feet apart. Uh, 10 feet, if you don't have a uh, big piece of equipment to go through them, I would go 12 or 13 feet if you're trying to get through them with a tractor. Uh, these are grown mainly as hedge rows. You don't need a trellis for the thorny ones. I would use a low trellis for the thornless erect ones. You'll need a trellis for the semi-erect ones and then the primocane fruiting ones, uh, 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 I, I would still put a trellis in there for those. <clears throat> uh, looking at raspberry plant spacing, <clears throat> uh, two feet apart for the uh, red and yellow ones, three feet apart for the black ones and three and a half feet apart for the purple ones. <clears throat> Don't get these rows too, clo too close because you know, these have some thorns on. You need to be able to get down through them. In planting these, you want to make sure you order virus-free plants uh, and get them fairly early in the spring to avoid uh, 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 winter injury. We plant them in the spring to avoid winter injury. And you can dig a furrow and put them in or dig individual holes. Put them in at the same depth as a nursery. Don't bury them extra deep. No, you don't want to see any roots sticking out. And of course, these are going to come in as dormant plants. So uh, it's a good idea before you plant them to soak them in water overnight. That'll improve your survival. Keep in mind that these dormant plants were dug in the fall and they've been in a cooler all winter. Uh, you can also get these as tissue culture plants. And if they come in as tissue culture plants, they will come be coming in right out of a greenhouse. So you're going to want to plant those around the first part of June after we're through our frost-free uh, 
uh, after, after we're frost free. Uh, the, in planting, particularly the first year, uh, putting them on black plastic or uh, I like to use a landscape fabric. That works out really nice. It'll last multiple year, years. Uh, keep in mind that these are called erect thornless blackberries in some cases, but they kind of trail the first year. So having something to keep from having to hoe around those plants helps out quite a bit. Uh, this works well for the uh, uh, blackberries. Uh, in fertilizing brambles for the first year, put down about four to 11 pounds of nitrogen per 100 foot a row. That's actual nitrogen, uh, depends on what sort of product you get. For example, over here, we've got an old bag of ammonium nitrate that you can't get anymore. You can buy something from Southern states. It's called Super Kicker. That's a 3300 uh, material. It's uh, ammonium sulfate and urea combined to get that analysis. Or here we have, uh, not sure what the, oh, 101010. So this is 10% nitrogen. This is 34% nitrogen. So you'd use a lot less of this fertilizer than you would 101010. This has got phosphorus and potassium in it. This one doesn't have any phosphorus or potassium. Uh, once you get your soil adjusted with the phosphorus and potassium, all you have to do is add nitrogen on an annual basis. Uh, second and succeeding years, three and a half to 10 pounds. We've got a pretty wide, wide range here. Depends on your soil. If your soil's kind of, your yard, if your yard's like mine where they kind of stripped the topsoil off and left you the subsoil, you want to put a little more nitrogen on there. You've got a really good soil. Uh, you may want to back off on the nitrogen a little bit. Uh, sometimes we'll add a little nitrogen in the fall, but it's pretty rare. It's mainly to grow the grass between the, the plants. Now, if you've got a lawn fertilizer company, <laughs> uh, lawn service, it's fertilizing your yard, they're probably going to fertilize your blackberries for you. You don't need to add anything else. Irrigation is really important on blackberries and raspberries. You can see over here on the right what happens when your blackberries come in during a drought. They shrivel up. This is what happens to a lot of the wild ones and you don't have much to pick. So typically you'll irrigate two to three times per week if it's dry. Uh, you're looking for about an average inch of rain a week on these. And uh, it's best to irrigate throughout the season. Keep in mind that after you harvest these, you're growing your canes for next year. If you drought stress them and don't take care of them, then you're not gonna get very big canes and you're not gonna get much of a crop the next year. This is, these are trickle lines, uh, probably a little bit over the top for backyard gardens, but this is a trickle tube with the emitters inserted into the line and you just have the drip area here it's, temp it's pressure compensated, so it puts out the same amount of water over the length of the pipe. This is a drip tube with a emitter inserted in it. Of course, they drip out. You like to have those emitters facing up to drip so they don't get dirt in them. The same is true here. Uh, you want to have the emitter facing up. Uh, you want to be very careful about insecticide applications when the things are blooming. So you really don't want to use insecticides on blackberries while they're in bloom because you got to get those flowers pollinated and all those little pistils in there have to have a little pollen on them to get that berry to fill out. Weed control is very important. Uh, you can use organic uh, techniques. You can put straw down. Uh, you can use wood chips on these. These work fine. Uh, these don't, wood chips don't work on apple trees and peach trees and things very well because they bring the voles in in the winter that chew on the roots. But uh, we don't have that problem with blackberries and raspberries. So uh, chips work fine. You'll want to increase your nitrogen application level a little bit. Synthetic, you've got black plastic. Black plastic will last for about a year, maybe two years, but the weeds start coming through it in the second year and you've got to pull it up. The landscape fabric will last a long time. They guarantee it for five years. I expect it'll last for you for 10 years. That works very well for most of the blackberries and so forth. Uh, you may have to cut the hole open a little bit wider as the plants get larger because uh, these canes come up, but they're generally coming up from the crown. Now these are red and yellow raspberries <clears throat> and these send suckers up all over. So putting a strip of landscape fabric down one side and a strip down the other side and filling the middle in with uh, bark chip mulch works out pretty well to let those uh, sprouts come up uh, in the middle there. 
want to be very careful about using a weed eater. This is a commercial blackberry planting that I visited a number of times, a number of years ago. And the fellow said, I don't know why the blackberries aren't performing very well. And I went out there and his help had beat the tar out of them with a weed eater. So uh, they don't do very well when you uh, nick them up like that. <clears throat> uh, if you have dormant plants, you want to prune these at planting. Uh, you cut the top off and leave a couple buds there or cut it off down to the soil level. Uh, this gets rid of any disease that might be on the canes and it'll keep them from trying to fruit the first year. What you're trying to do is grow a plant the first year. So it's going to send a lot of buds up from the canes here. You know, this is a cane that's left from the previous year. So this is a floor cane. It's going to try to send some fruit out. Uh, with tissue culture plants, you just uh, put them in and let them grow. Uh, you can buy root cuttings for things like thorny blackberries and things. We don't recommend those. They're cheap, but they take about two months to come out of the ground and you've got to keep track of the weeds over top of those for a couple months before you see anything. Uh, in pruning these is very important. It will increase the size of your fruit and it'll increase the sugar content a little bit because it cuts down on competition. For June bearing red raspberries that send sprouts up at the base, we try to grow them as a hedge row. Uh, keep that row about 16 to 18 inches wide at the base. They will keep sending stuff up and gradually take your whole yard over if you let them, but you got to keep mowed off at the edge here. Uh, these are not summer tip like our other blackberries and raspberries because they just send another shoot up and they don't branch. So uh, in the spring, you want to remove the dead floor canes from the previous year, or uh, you could take them out the year, the fall before. Uh, narrow your rows to 16 or 18 inches wide here. Uh, you want to take out the little skinny canes. Leave the thicker canes. They're the ones that are going to produce the big fruit, and you want about four to five canes per foot of row. It's not very many canes when you're done pruning, but uh, that maximizes your quality fruit production. If you're caned, if you've got a really fertile site, you'll want to cut the tips of those canes off at about a five foot height uh, to keep them from bending over too much with a fruit load. In the summer, mow along the edge and keep those new sprouts from coming up on the edge of the planting. Okay, these are fall bearing red and yellow raspberries. Okay, now these produce uh, fruit on the prima canes the first year, they winter over and you get fruit on the floor canes the, the second year. Uh, in the past, we've just come in and mowed those off in the, in the early in the spring and just gotten the prima cane crop. The prima cane crop comes in in the fall when the spotted wing drosophila are the worst. Okay, the, the floor canes are gonna produce raspberries in June and those are gonna be outside of the spotted wing drosophila uh, area. So that would work okay. But if you mow them off, you're not gonna get the floor crane crop off of those. So we don't recommend these. Typically you'll put a post in and you can put some baler twine in between here, some plastic twine to hold them up, it makes a nice trellis. Uh, you want to leave about three or four of the largest canes per foot of row in, in the spring. Here's what fall bearing red raspberries look like and uh, uh, without leaves and with leaves. Uh, raspberry trellises, uh, this is kind of a nice trellis with a two by four here with some slots so they can move the wires in or out uh, as they like. Uh, this one is uh, kind of dangerous. Uh, the fellows use barbed wire in between there. It keeps the canes from moving, but uh, kind of like extra thorns in there. Uh, here we have black and purple raspberries, and these are trained a little more like uh, uh, blackberries. These grow in a hill system. They send shoots up from one, one place in the ground here. Uh, we summer tip these to get them to branch because we get the fruit off of the branches. So black raspberries, when they get up to about two feet in height, we pinch the top off or cut the top off, and you need to do this when it's dry because you can transfer diseases if it's wet. So uh, wait till they dry off before tipping them. Purple raspberries tip to 28 to 32 inches. Uh, we don't pinch royalty. Uh, uh, 
you can grow these without a trellis or we'll typically put uh, a little T in here and have two horizontal wires to help hold them up. Uh, in the spring, you remove the dead floor canes, thin out the spindly canes, usually take uh, one or two skinny canes out of the hill, cut your laterals back to about uh, 10 to 12 inches in length and remove any laterals that are down here close to the ground because they're just gonna produce berries that lay in the dirt. Okay, pruning thornless erect and semi-erect blackberries. Uh, I mentioned they have a trailing growth habit the first season. You can see this is last year's growth. These are the floor canes running across the ground. These are the primocanes coming up. They're erect the second year. Uh, typically, we'll take off the lower, uh, lower canes and uh, just cut them back a little bit and we'll get some fruit crop fruit on them. Uh, down in Arkansas, they'll just tie these canes up to a trellis wire with uh, flagging tape and go ahead and harvest them. Here we have a thornless erect blackberry pruning uh, uh, before pruning over here and after pruning. So we're taking the little skinny canes out, we're leaving the big ones. We're cutting the laterals back to about 13 to 16 inches in length. We're taking a third to a quarter of the number of canes coming out of the ground here. And uh, if anything has a redneck cane bore in it, we're going to take that out. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. <clears throat> uh, here's John Clark, the blackberry breeder that's bred most of these at blackberries uh, in Arkansas. This is a trellis he put up for his thornless or red blackberries. This is just a metal T-post with a U-bolt holding some cross arms on it and some wires on the end. If you're doing this in your backyard, you don't quite need to need uh, something this uh, hefty to, to support that uh, end of the row, but you do need to uh, uh, put uh, something in here to keep these trellises from pulling in. These are erect thornless blackberries uh, down at our uh, Princeton station in Western Kentucky. You can see we've got one wire up here, worked uh, pretty well for holding those up. This is why we cut them back to leave the laterals. This is a lateral on a thorny blackberry and you can see a bud on the lateral, it produces a shoot with a whole cluster of, cluster of fruit. Here's the next bud produces a cluster of fruit. So on those laterals, wherever you have a bud, generally you get a cluster of fruit coming off of there. Okay, the semi-erect blackberries, these are the big ones. Uh, you can put them on a two-wire trellis. I don't recommend that, but in the backyard where you don't have a lot to do, uh, uh, labor isn't a problem. Uh, you've got to tie each one of these canes up to the wire. And when you tie it up to the wire, you make a tight tie around the wire and a loose tie around the cane because that cane will expand during the season. If you make a tight tie around it, you'll girdle that cane. Generally, you fan them out on the, on the trellis and spread them out. There's a two-wire trellis. This is the type of trellis we've had at the university farm. This is a Chester. It's a really big one. That's about six, seven feet tall right there. And uh, uh, the double T type trellis with a wire here and a wire here and one down here and one down here uh, help to hold those canes in. You don't have to do much, if any, tying, and it works out pretty nice. So for the thornless erect blackberries, we'll uh, tip the primocanes when they extend one foot above the top wire where you don't have to tip them. Uh, remove any dead fruiting canes from the previous year. And then in the spring, you take a third to a quarter of the total number of fruiting canes that are coming out of the ground, leaving the big canes. Any canes that have these swellings in, up like up here in the corner, this is a redneck cane borer, it's a beetle and it's overwintering in that uh, uh, swel swelling there. Uh, you cut that out and throw it in the fireplace or send it out with the trash. That's our cultural way of controlling this pest. If you get two of these in a cane, it kills the cane. And a, a lot of times these come in just above the ground on your nice biggest cane and you gotta take it out. Uh, you prune the laterals back to about 18 inches in length and remove any low laterals that are close to the ground. So there's that Chester plant that you looked at a little earlier and it's got, it's pruned back to its laterals. We've left all the big canes coming out of there and we've got a tremendous fruit potential on that plant. Okay, pruning primocane fruiting blackberries. These are the ones that have the two crops that fruit on the primocanes. We find that you get a much higher yield if you pinch these twice. So you pinch them when they 
uh, or tip them when they get to 12 to 15 inches in length, in height. Then you tip them again when they reach 30 inches. That produces a lot more laterals and substantially increases your fruit yield on these. Okay, we get to harvest. This is a thornless semi-erect ones. These are the ones that are tart. And that one right there, it'll take the enamel right off your teeth, okay? Uh, they'll get to this red stage and then they get to the jet black shiny stage and then they get a little bit of a dull appearance to them. That's when the sugar content is up. That's when they taste really good. If you're picking them to sell, uh, you got to pick them in the shiny phase and add a little sugar to them in some cases. This gives you an idea when some of these harvest. It varies by as much as a week or 10 days from one year to the next. But the thorny ones come in in June, up into the middle of July. Spotted wing drosophila up here shows up about the middle of July or a little bit earlier. Thornless erect uh, will keep away from that spotted wing drosophila the first part. You may have to put a spray or two on at the end of the season. Thornless semi erect, July 1 to September 1. Uh, primocane fruiting one, July 20th to August 5th. I'm sorry, June 20th to August 5th on the primocane crop, and then August 20th to frost on the, I'm sorry, I got that mixed up. June 20th to August 5th on the floricane crop. Those are the ones that winter over winter. And then August 20th to the frost on the primocane crop if it doesn't get too hot. Again, you wanna avoid harvesting berries when they're wet because this will make them roll, uh, uh, mold in, in the refrigerator or storage. Pick them gently, lift the berry with your thumb and fingers and then uh, put them in a shallow container and uh, you're good to go. Uh, uh, typically, we'll harvest early in the season, every three to five days. In the middle of the season, when it's hot, every other day uh, or every two days uh, is a good time to harvest these things. But they put out a lot of berries. Uh, these berries have a really high respiration rate, so they're burning their sugars up really rapidly. So the quicker you can get them cooled after you pick them, the better your quality is going to be. So you want to refrigerate them within an hour of, uh, of harvest, uh, cool them to 32 to 40 degrees. And for spotted wing drosophila, the closer you can get them to 32, the better. Uh, each hour delay in getting berries refrigerated reduces your storage life by about a day. So looking at some of the diseases that you can encounter, anthracnose and cane blight are two of the bigger ones. And you're going to want to use a delayed dormant spray. That's when these canes start putting these young shoots out and you want to put on uh, 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 fixed copper, copper hydroxide. There's a whole bunch of different names of products that these are sold as. It's basically uh, copper sulfate that's been safened with lime, uh, blue, blue Shield, Coside. Uh, a lot of the home garden centers have a liquid copper. That's what you want to put on. This kills a lot of this disease that keeps it from getting started on the blackberries and raspberries. Here's anthracnose on a blackberry fruit. It sort of puts a little dead pucker on the end of the fruit. And of course it causes lesions in the cane. Uh, we will spray, uh, particularly in wet seasons with some captan, it has a three day pre-harvest interval, but a few sprays of that during the growing season will help you out quite a bit with these. This is crown gall. This is a bacterial, uh, this is a bacterial disease. And uh, it, uh, it's a reason you have to dig those blackberries out uh, and get rid of them. Uh, this comes in when we have winter injury to the canes in a lot of cases. And it's sort of a, looks like a cancerous type growth. This is the orange rust that I mentioned before. If you see this, all you can do is dig those plants out and get rid of them. Uh, you can't just spray them with Roundup because they'll release these spores. They release spores. This disease releases spores two times a year. You can see this driving down I-75 at 70 miles an hour uh, when the wild blackberries along the road have this. It's on the undersides of the leaves. This is systemic. Once it in the, it's in the plant, we can't get it out of there. Uh, we have uh, uh, impatience necrotic spot virus. Some of these viruses can get into blackberries and this is your uh, crop. Uh, not much to pick. Uh, you can't get viruses out of the plant. So if you get to this point, you just got to get rid of them. <clears throat> For orange rust, we try to rogue out the infected plants early in early spring and destroy them. 
This is a plant that's starting to come down with orange rust. You can see the orange rust starting to show up on the leaves. The leaves are a little bit more strap-like. They're a little slimmer than the other ones here. So this is a time you dig that whole plant out, roots and all, and uh, get rid of it. If you cut it off and leave the roots there, it's going to send up shoots and they're going to have orange rust too. Uh, we can spray with Immunox uh, that'll, that'll help with this, but uh, the best thing is to destroy the wild blackberries around your planting if they've got this orange rust in it because they release the spores. This is yellow rust. Uh, it's a yellow color. You don't dig your blackberries out if this shows up. This is not a problem. <laughs> Uh, it's just a disease on the leaves. It's not going to affect your yields or anything. Uh, this shows up in really wet years. It's, it's very rarely a problem. This is rosette or double blossom. Uh, characteristic are the, of this disease is the, the uh, berries that don't have very many droplets on and you've got long sepals here at the base of the fruit. Uh, they get sort of witch's brooms here with multiple berries that don't set fruit. Uh, you can get rid of a lot of this by just mowing your plants off and losing the crop, depending on what kind of blackberries you've got or raspberries for a year. This, this only hits uh, blackberries and black raspberries. It doesn't hit red raspberries. Uh, we've talked a little bit about tissue culture plants. This is what they look like. Uh, these tend to be the most virus-free plants that you can get. This is a spotted wing drosophila that I keep talking about. Uh, this is a fruit fly, and this is a new fruit fly. It's been around uh, Kentucky now for 10 years. It came in from another country. And this uh, female has a saw on her egg-laying apparatus, and she saws a hole in the fruit and lays an egg in there while the fruit is on the plant. Uh, the the, the uh, Drosophila or the fruit flies that we've had up to this, the point that this one showed up in the state, uh, just damaged, uh, got into damaged fruit and we weren't gonna eat that anyway. But this one's laying eggs in good fruit. And they're really a problem on fall raspberries, blackberries. Uh, they can get into blueberries and they get into the uh, everbearing strawberries later in the summer. Uh, they can get into peaches in the backyard. You're gonna use entrust or spinosad on a weekly basis once they start showing up, or you can use uh, malathion. Uh, you've got to be very careful about the insecticides that you're using close to harvest. So you want to look at the pre-harvest interval, and these are uh, either, uh, these are about one day pre-harvest intervals. So you can spray and wait 24 hours and harvest the fruit. Uh, this is what spotted ring drosophila eggs look like. And uh, uh, you can't see them on the fruit. There's a little breathing tube that comes out of there. You can see this one, the little breathing tube on the egg. This is a blackberry droplet. So this is a really close up shot. Uh, you put these blackberries in the refrigerator close to 32, it kills most of these eggs. Nobody uh, worries about eating the eggs. Uh, when the eggs hatch out, you get these little larvae in the, in the blackberries and that's where uh, you, we run into problems. So there's nothing poisonous about these. You can eat them, but uh, most people don't want to. Uh, this is one way to keep the spotted wing drosophila out. Uh, you can get this Protec netting, which is fairly expensive, or a floating row cover type thing to screen them out. You just Cover the plants up once the berries start turning red and start getting close to ripe. I used one of these on my blackberries, my uh, erect thornless blackberries in my yard last year. It worked very well. Uh, uh, we had one of these set up out at the Hort Research Farm and uh, Groundhog decided he was going to go right on through. He didn't want to go around it. So uh, he kind of opened it up to the spotted wing drosophila. But the spotted wing drosophila, like the shade, uh, picking in the middle of the day, which isn't great, uh, is le the less chance of getting spotted wing drosophila inside of here. Here's a redneck cane borer. This is what the beetle looks like. It's a little tiny skinny beetle. There's a lot of magnification there. But uh, uh, these over, the adults lay eggs here and uh, the larvae go directly into the plant and uh, go down into the pith. 
and then they overwinter in this cane and pupate in April. So if you cut these out in the winter and get rid of them, you break that life cycle. Uh, Japanese beetles and green June beetles. Uh, these are problems on blackberries and raspberries. The, the uh, green June beetles are fruit feeders. They're going to go after the overripe fruit. So if you, when you're picking them, pick the overripe fruit or rotten fruit and take them out of there. Uh, that'll get out any spotted winged Drosophila that might be in there. And the Japanese beetles generally are leaf feeders, but they get in into the fruit also, but they're going after the overripe fruit. So uh, in the past, we've used uh, seven or which the active ingredient is carbaryl. It has a seven day pre-harvest interval. So that's not one we can use on uh, uh, blackberries and raspberries when we're harvesting them because uh, we've got to harvest every other day or every two days. Uh, there's another product that's also called Seven. It's a synthetic pyrethroid, and that has a one-day pre-harvest interval. So uh, that will uh, work fairly well for these Japanese beetles. Malathion has a one-day pre-harvest interval. It's a little bit stinky. And then we've got the uh, Nemex or Aza Direct. Uh, this is an extract from a neem tree. This is an organic product. It's a repellent. It'll keep them out for a couple days, but they're going to be back in there. Uh, particularly after a rain. This is a raspberry crown borer. These are really rare to see in blackberries or raspberries in Kentucky. Uh, it's a moth that looks kind of like a yellow jacket. And you see these when you prune them down at the base. This larvae spends two years in the cane. They'll get up to an inch, inch, inch in length or so. They're, they're pretty big uh, insects. They hollow the cane out. So you notice them down there at the bottom when you're pruning them. We don't have any good homeowner remedies for, for this one. Uh, we get white droplets on blackberries. Uh, can be caused by several things. Uh, stink bugs feeding on the individual droplets can cause them to, to turn white. Uh, if you've got thrips in there, these are really tiny things. Uh, they hop, uh, you usually don't notice them much, but they can cause some of these right white droplets on the fruit. We also can get sunburn on the fruit. And uh, with the sunburn, uh, it's just like we get sunburn. Uh, if you've had a bunch of cloudy days and the berry hasn't gotten used to the sun, then we get some bright sunny weather, they sunburn. <laughs> so that floating row cover for spotted winged Drosophila will substantially reduce your, your sunburn. Uh, a little bit on bramble sanitation measures. Uh, Rotate your plantings. Once you take them out, uh, stick something else in that spot for a while before you put blackberries or raspberries back in there. Uh, cut and remove your old fruiting canes after harvest and get rid of them. Don't leave them laying by the blackberries or raspberries. Uh, good weed control. Mowing around these promotes rapid drying and reduces your disease problems. Uh, keep your rows narrow so they'll dry out a little faster or make it easier to pick them. Uh, inspect your blackberries and raspberries when the plants are 12 to 14 inches tall, looking for orange rust and viruses and dig out the plants if it's detected. And remove your overripe fruit to discourage the buildup of spotted winged Drosophila. I haven't talked about sap beetles. These are little tiny black beetles that get into the, the fruit when they're overripe. So get the overripe fruit out of there. Uh, wasps and can be attracted normally in drier year, years and uh, fruit rots and uh, fruit flies. Uh, birds like black raspberries, so you're just going to have to net them if you're going to see any black raspberries. So, Occasionally we get winter injury. We talked about that on the thornless ones. And uh, usually we start getting winter injury at zero and it's about 100% dead at about minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Every once in a while we get called liars for this because it gets a little bit colder than that, but that's generally the, the uh, t critical temperature for those. Uh, the blackberries come out and they look like they're doing fine. You figure, I did great. And then all of a sudden that cane collapses and dies. And what happens is when that cane freezes, it ruins the conductive system of the plant. It has enough conductive system to get that plant up and growing early in the spring. And then it gets hot and it can't pump enough water and so it dies. This cane is winter injured and we've got cane blight moving in there on that. And that tends to reduce the conductive conductivity of the cane. Uh, we very rarely see winter injury on raspberries. They're a lot hardier than blackberries. But this is what I've been waiting for the whole talk here. That's what I kind of like about blackberries and raspberries or the, the desserts. 
let's see. Let me. Let's see here. Let's get back to this. Uh, let's see. Well, am I still in here? You're still in here, John. Uh, okay, I was trying to get my blackberries in the background back up. Uh, not sure how to do that. But uh, the, the blackberries behind my picture here are from Eckert's Orchard here in Versailles. And this is a little bit too extensive for home growers. But uh, this is a trellis that uh, swings. And uh, let's see. Uh, the trellis there you, go, John. there you go, John. I took care of it. You got it up? OK, I got good. It up. Great. <laughs> that's not what I'm seeing, so that's that's fine. But uh, uh, the blackberries on this, the, the primocanes come up and they're trained on one side of the trellis. And then uh, in the spring, they're swung over. So they're horizontal on the other side of the trellis. And then the flowers grow up towards the sunshine. And once the flowers are formed, that trellis is swung back over. And the one on the other side is swung in, so you've got a tunnel of black blackberries that you're walking down to pick. Blackberries are on both sides, and you're shaded. Uh, it's it's a pretty slick operation, but it's a difficult trellis to put up. You're only seeing half the trellis there. That's the those are just the the primocanes coming up. Uh, uh, meanwhile, when those turn into uh, uh, floricanes, the new primocanes are coming up the other side of the trellis. So it's a little bit of a complicated deal, but uh, <laughs> it's kind of, kind of interesting to see if you're ever up in Versailles during blackberry season, it's worth stopping by just to see that. That's a, that swing trellis is something that Eckert's Orchard developed on their own. So it, it's, uh, Eckert's is the biggest, uh, one of the biggest fruit producers over in Illinois outside of St. Louis. And they've also got, uh, uh, or two other orchards over there, and then they've uh, purchased uh, Boyd's Orchard, so it's now Eckert's Orchard in, in Versailles. I'd be glad to answer any questions if anybody has questions. I think you had a couple. Um, I had a question about whether Mustang Max was labeled for brambles, because I know it's got a one day. Mustang Max is labeled for brambles, yes. Okay. It's a synthetic pyrethroid, and it has a uh, probably one day pre-harvest interval on it. So that's one that a lot of our commercial growers like to use. They use Mustang Max and Delegate, but you're not gonna find that in a small homeowner container. Sure. Um, okay. So Woody's asking the question, when harvesting to sell, should you not wash them before packaging? Don't wash them, they'll rot, okay? Uh, just pick them into the container and pick them after the dew is dried off in the morning. Pick them directly into the marketing tank container, but you don't want to wash them at all. You wash them before you eat them or before you freeze them. That's true for almost all the fruit, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then Jessica's got a question about whether there's an organic alternative to captan for anthracnose control. Um, we're getting the... Uh, the uh, fixed copper that we talked about, that's the only thing you've got early in the spring. It's a one application, but there's nothing that I'm aware of fungicide wise that's organic during the season. Uh, we don't have many good organic fungicides, unfortunately. Hey, Jeremy, did I miss any? I think you got them all there, Shad. All right, all right, folks, are, are there any other questions you want to ask? Uh, got another question from Jessica. The bla best black, black raspberry for the market that holds up to post harvest? Jewel. I would say Jewel. John, why are you yeah. saying Jewel as opposed to Bristol? What was the distinction between Bristol and Jewel? Jewel has better disease resistance. And it's a bigger, little bigger berry than Bristol, I think. 
Did it come from Bristol? Is Jewel the replacement for Bristol? Yeah. I don't know if Bristol is in Jewel's parentage. Jewel's been around for a long time. Okay. The ag agents always order that Bristol, and I was just curious why they go with the Bristol as opposed to the Jewel. Uh, Jewel would be a better choice. Okay. So she's saying that she's got a, a, a huge problem with anthracnose uh, and wants to know, I, I guess, if Jewel has some uh, resistance to anthracnose. Yes, a little bit of resistance. And spray with that fixed copper just at bud break. And then I would try to get, as soon as they're finished harvesting, okay, as soon as the black raspberries are done harvesting, take those old floor canes out and get them out of there because they have spores on that'll go to your new canes. You think she's probably getting that anthracnose from wild ones that are growing nearby? I would say certainly and I don't know if if her yard is shaded or something like that that would enhance the anthracnose too. If the longer they stay wet the more disease problems you have. Any others? A lot of people thanking you. Uh, that well, if you have other questions, send them in to the agents and they can get with me if they can't answer them. So uh, we can get you fixed up. But uh, blackberries and raspberries are really nice to grow in the black backyard. There are not a lot of sprays on them like we have for apples and pears and peaches. And they're generally usually pretty hardy. We don't miss a crop too often unless it gets really cold in the winter. Hey, the Laney's had a question. They have uh, Bristol on their order forms here. Can we get others uh, the Jewel? Uh, Bill's been getting those ordered in with us. So that's why that's been on the order form. And I think we need to uh, uh, talk with Bonnie. There's several things that I think, uh, you know, she's been getting the Patriot and the Blue Crop on the Blueberry too. And uh, I'm not a huge fan of either of those. Uh, John might disagree with me, I don't know, but uh, I've, I've grown Patriot and, and Blue Crop and I've not been terribly impressed with the flavor of the Blue Crop or the uh, the vigor of the, the Patriot. Uh, but uh, we've consistently gotten uh, the Bristol as opposed to the Jewel. So um, we'll be trying to make sure that that changes. Well, you're also down in Southeast Kentucky and you've got some varieties that do better down there than in other parts of the state. You You've got first-hand knowledge of that, Shad. <laughs> well, I, I've grown the Bristol and the Jewel, but I couldn't remember which one uh, was the best, so I'm glad that you uh, pointed that out to us. There's nothing better than a, a good uh, uh, jam made out of uh, black raspberry. Uh, that, that's for sure. <laughs> that's my favorite. Sure. They're, they're really high in antioxidants too, but they're one of the tougher raspberries to grow. So you've got to, got to be patient. Uh, crank the organic matter up in the ground before you plant those, they'll do a lot better. Very good. Okay, we've got another question. This is my second year of growing blueberry and raspberry starts that I purchased. This year they are blooming with flowers. I had not planted them in the ground uh, but protected them in flower pots. Uh, when can I transfer? Uh, they can go ahead and plant those. If, if they're in flower pots, they can plant them right now. Yeah, that would be fine. Just plant them and water them in good. Good questions. Yep. Any more? Okay. John, thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thanks for putting up with me for a whole hour. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Hey, I think we've got you back next week too, don't we? Yeah, you, you got me. You, you got to listen to me again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're looking forward to it. Okay. Everybody have a great evening. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you all uh, for stopping by and uh, spending an hour and a few more minutes with us. And Hopefully we'll see you uh, tomorrow night. Uh, we're doing lawn care tomorrow night. Uh, Thursday is part one of basic forest management. So hopefully we'll see you again this week. All right. Thanks, guys. See you all. Thanks, John.